Welcome to The Dish, the show that uncovers the stories behind the world's most famous dishes. We are your hosts, Tomo and Megzi from foodfuntravel.com. Join us and expert guests for tasty facts, foodie secrets and more. In part one of this double episode on Georgian cuisine, we explore the history of the Republic of Georgia and how culinary influences from across Asia and Europe have molded the dishes they eat today. All of these different cultures have affected how Georgian cuisine has developed. The Greek and Balkan influence, the ancient Roman influence, Middle Eastern, Turkish, Central Asian and Mongolian coming through the Silk Road and, of course, through conquests from Mongolians and Russian and and Indian influence. Indian influences came through Iran and that then filtered its way up in this direction as well. So it's not just a partial influence in this region, whereas, say, in England, we were influenced by Chinese cuisine because people from Hong Kong came and lived in England. But here it was people who actually occupied the region. They brought their cuisine and their customs. And all of that stuff has sort of been developed and brought into Georgian cuisine and to Georgian culture. Plus, we discuss the history of Georgia's national dish, Kachapuri, as well as a roundup of the many different versions of that dish you can find across the country. With your basic Kachapuri, you might have a bit of butter rubbed across the top. So it's got a nice buttery crust. With some kachapuri, they've literally taken the end of the butter, chopped off about four ounces of butter, and then just let it sit on the top, melting. A solid slab. It is quite fantastic. (laughs) It really is. It's one of the best things ever. Welcome to another episode of The Dish. Hello, 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 hello. In this episode, we're back to our what to eat in format, which means we'll be talking about specific dishes we love from a destination of our choice, which today is Georgia, most specifically Tbilisi, Mm because it's uh, the capital of Georgia and it's where you can get pretty much everything from Georgian cuisine that you could possibly want to eat. Yeah, the actual different regions of Georgia can vary quite a bit in cuisine and wine and stuff like that. So if you want a little, little melting pot of everything... Tbilisi is definitely the place. Yeah, literally everything is available here. So it's an amazing time for a foodie. You can just spend a month here. or If you've only got a week, come spend a week. A year. A, yeah, a There's year a year would be a good option. on arrival. And then you can try pretty much every type of cuisine. You can find it. There are different restaurants for every single region of Georgia in Tbilisi. Amazing foodie city. Really, really fantastic. And I think since our first visit here in 2016, Georgian cuisine almost instantly jumped into our top five best places in the world to eat. Absolutely. Everybody told us there were were certain people that had reached out and they were like, oh my God, have you guys been to Georgia yet? And we were like, no, why? And they're like, just trust us, go there. And we did. And oh my God, it's amazing. Life-changing food. Oh, for sure. Just cheesy, bready, dumpling meaty, whiny wonderland. So yeah, in this episode, we'll be sharing a little bit about the history of some of the dishes. The histories are a little bit difficult with these because it's uh, such a crazy country where so many different people have invaded the area. It's been Georgian. It's been... Iranian, it's been Roman. There's loads of things. We're going to go through that. Also that this region is just so old. Like, old, old. Apparently, the earliest ever discovery of human remains outside of Africa is in Georgia, and it's 1.8 million years old. That's just stupid crazy. I mean, I grew up in Australia. The oldest thing we've got is like 250 years old. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> That's not true at nah, all. No, it's older than that. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it feels like it. Aboriginals were there like 40,000 years ago. Yeah, I, okay, I was being very culturally insensitive then. I'm sorry. Actually, yeah, this stuff from like 22 million years ago. <laughs> but like, you know, a Human building. history, modern human history, there's not a lot. And to be fair, the, the modern human history here, that 1.8 million year old human remains... That's not modern humans. That's not Homo sapiens. That's uh, previous to that. Um, But still, there is evidence of Neolithic occupation around here, around about 6000 BC, perhaps a little bit earlier than that. So people have definitely lived in this region for a long time. And I think to understand the cuisine, we are going to have to do a bit of a history roundup because there is a lot of history. And as I said, this country has changed hands Many, many times. So before we get into the dishes, let's look at some of that. So first of all, the Republic of Georgia, maybe not the most famous country in the world yet. Maybe it it will be soon. But 
in case you're not sure exactly where that is, it sits really in the crossroads between East and West. I feel like it's very European when you're here, but it's, its cultural history is represented through all of these different cultures that surround it. We've got the Black Sea on the west-hand side. Azerbaijan and the Caspian Sea is on the east of Georgia. To the north is Russia. To the south, Armenia, Turkey, and Iran. And of course, further down from that, all through into Pakistan, India, etc. Yep. So it's it's surrounded by all these different cultures. That so it's almost like Central Asia, but it's but not, it's not Asian. It's really not Asian at all. It doesn't feel Asian when you're here. No, because it's not too far until you hit the stands from here, and that's when you really hit sort of Asia territory. But here, absolutely not. Yeah, straight across Azerbaijan, you already feels like Asia. Yeah. Whereas Georgia, you're one country over, and it totally feels like Europe. So through its history, it has been invaded. It has been invaded many, many times. Poor people. Yeah, uh, it was a bad time for Georgia for quite a few thousand years uh, until. Until very recently, until 10 years ago, there has been stuff going on. And it's said that Georgian hospitality towards guests is actually so great because most people who have visited over the millennia have wanted to kill people and take their land. So if you're actually coming here in peace, you are very graciously welcome. <laughs> Which is so sad in a kind of funny way. They are really lovely people and so welcoming. It's so sad that that is... Uh... The way that they welcome people, it's like, oh, welcome. You don't want my stuff? You don't want it? You're not, oh, you're not here to rape and pillage? Yes. Yeah. Have some wine. Let's Here's party. Wine. <laughs> so, yeah, Georgia's landscape as well. It's not just the fact that so many different people have lived here and so many different cultures have shared their influence, but also that the landscape itself, it goes from the Black Sea, this humid, tangerine-growing land. They're growing tropical-style fruits over on the east by the coast. That goes all the way through the mountainous northlands where they're herding sheep and doing lots of sort of that pasture-related produce, all the way through to the wine regions in the west. I mean, there's wine regions all over Georgia. They're famous for wine. Oh, yeah. But the Kajeti region in the west is probably the biggest producing region because the climate there is just perfect for many types of wine. One of the other biggest influences is the Silk Road. So, of course, this is a very famous trade route. Like the original Silk Road used to pass through Iran on its way to Europe, and it didn't really spend that much time going through Georgia. But then there was this big problem in the 6th century where the Byzantine Empire, which was what happened after the Roman Empire broke up, it became the Byzantine Empire. They were having a big old spat with the Iranian region. And so the Silk Road couldn't come through to them that way anymore because people were like, nope, we're not letting you take trade over there. So they moved the trade route to go north of the Caspian Sea and down through Georgia and then towards the Black Sea and towards Turkey. Oh. So... And we'll get onto this in another episode. That is one of the reasons why trade coming from China was coming through Georgia. I've got to say, a lot of things are making sense right now for me. Now, Not yeah. for so many people listening, It'll but make sense. it all makes sense soon, I'm sure. Yeah, because there's a lot of food here that maybe you'd say might have been influenced a little bit by uh, the Chinese. But still, so this route was officially recorded. The very first caravan came through in 568 AD. So it was actually written down that these guys turned up mm. and uh, it passed through one of the customs gorges. Customs be customs. Yeah. <laughs> the customs office is like, who are you? Do you have a, pa do you have a visa? <laughs> I need to stamp your passport. Mm, I'm just going to walk over here and talk to my mate for like five minutes and stare at you in a weird way. I need to I stamp your camel. All the time. <laughs> I need to stamp your camel. Has this been tested for, <laughs> yeah. you know, for <laughs> tropical diseases? I don't know. It's like that thing. Every time we pass through some sort of new airport, they take my Australian passport and like want to go look at it for like five minutes because it's got all holograms and stuff. If you've ever seen an Australian passport, it is actually pretty cool. The new ones have these holograms in it and it's got all the Australian animals. So anybody around the world who's ever seen bloody Skippy the kangaroo or Flipper the... No, actually, we don't have any dolphins. I think that was an American show. <laughs> anyway, this is Skippy the kangaroo or a koala or a platypus. They just... They look at it like a, a flip-through book for about 10 minutes while I'm standing in line and everybody behind me is standing in line as well, staring at me, wondering what drugs I'm smuggling. Well, let's face it. When we travel, if we say we're Australian, the first thing anyone says, kangaroo! Kangaroo! For straight up, no messing around. That's the first thing they say to Australians. So it's, it's an international word. Everyone knows what it is. See it in your passport and they're very excited. So people from the, these trade routes, from the New Silk Road, 
in 568 AD. Sure. It's very new. It's the mm. new Silk Road. Yes. Would have passed through one of the northern areas of Georgia. And that will also make sense a little bit later when we talk about the food that that's influenced. And um, down through past Tbilisi eventually, as Tbilisi was being founded around about the 7th century. And then across the Black Sea. So what is most important now, of course, is that those trade routes were bringing goods in both directions. So east and west were pretty much meeting in Georgia rather than meeting in Iran or perhaps in Turkey. They were meeting in Georgia. Maybe stuff was being transported by sea straight out from the Black Sea. That was also happening. And that's going to lead to new ingredients coming in. And, you know, people are stealing stuff off the cart rather than letting it go all the way through to Europe. But also there's going to be different people who are passing through that are bringing their food with them and going, you know, that sharing culture of like, what is it that you're eating? It's like, oh, would you like some? Of course, they weren't speaking English, but, you know, <laughs> but, but, you know, that sharing thing. And then people are like, hey, I like that. I'm going to I'm going to keep I'm going to keep cooking that. How'd you make that? And that's how you end up with, you know, new cuisines and interesting destinations. Exactly. So it was a location where cultures definitely mixed and where trade flourished. And, of course, as I mentioned, a big diversity in natural produce because of all the different landscapes and all the different climates within the country and all the different growing pastures. It's one of the best melting pots in Central Europe, I think, because it's so European, but it's so influenced from Asia, from every direction, from the south, from the north, uh, and now also from Russia, from the north. It, they've just had everything. Yeah. Everything's happened here. Yeah, and you, you definitely get a little taste test of everything here in Georgia, but I very, very clearly want to state that they've made it Georgian. Even though all these influences have come through throughout time and they've adapted it, when you have it here, it is Georgian. You are having Georgian cuisine. You're not having those dumplings from there. Like, oh, they're, they're obviously Mongolian dumplings. No, they're not. They're Georgian dumplings. It's, they've definitely taken everything and made it their own and made it their own cuisine that there's no way you would ever, ever say anything different to that. All right, I'm going to do a quick roundup of some important milestones in the history so you can get a, a sense of what's going on, and then we're going to get on to the actual food and the dishes. Starting so, from how early, AD? We're going to start not from 1.8 million a, uh, BC. <laughs> we're going to start from uh, 10,000 BC. So the epicenter of the Neolithic era started in Anatolia around 10,000 BC, which is now modern-day Turkey. And that was happening just a few hundred miles west of where Georgia's capital Tbilisi is today. And uh, on this small hill, less than 20 miles south of Tbilisi, archaeologists found some mud brick houses close to a fertile river valley. Now, the mound is called Gadchachil Gora, and it's a bunch of Stone Age farmers who were living there about 8,000 years ago. They were wine fans. Really? Yes, of course. And possibly they might be the earliest wine fans in history. This is pretty heavily contested, though, isn't it? They, they like to have a bit of rivalry around this region about this very fact. Is that, That's pretty right. Well, yes, but we'll get into that. So essentially, there's some really rough pottery that's been left there that's actually decorated with bunches of grapes. And uh, so they, they really did like the grapes. And As do I. Well, of course. And especially when they're turned into something good. So the analysis... No, grapes are good as by themselves. Oh, that's true. Grapes are great. And then they turn them into wine and they're amazing. So they analysed the pollen from the site as well, like ancient pollen, and it suggests that they would definitely have it. They definitely had a lot of grapevines on the wooded hillside around that area at that time when they were there. So this international team of archaeologists came in and they've conclusively shown that the people living at Gadatril Gora and some nearby villages were almost certainly the world's earliest known winemakers. Not to say there's not still more things to find. No, they're actually really actively searching to see if there is any piece of evidence out there that is older. But currently, Georgia has the title 8,000 years. That's pretty bloody impressive, i got to say. They're searching in the same area still because they think they might find something that predates this. But these guys were producing wine on a large scale as early as 6,000 BC. So yeah, about 8,000 years ago. And that's a time when prehistoric humans were still reliant on stone and bone tools. It does my head in. Like, what? But still, yeah, I mean, I think their philosophy must have been make wine, not war. And i got to agree with that. I think that still is their philosophy here in Georgia, actually. <laughs> yeah. So it's believed that wine was made very near to the site of this village and then transported in smaller jugs for consumption in the village. And that's what the broken pottery they found was some sort of transport jug. They brought it from maybe where it was grown and there it was made into wine. And then they filled up the jugs and took them back to the village. And they've done carbon dating on the pottery and it's proven that it is between 6,000 and 5,800 BC when this pottery was full of wine. It's about 8,000 years ago. Crazy. Does my head in. Love it. 
Let's move on from that because obviously not a lot happens in the old BCs. Uh, you get a bit, <laughs> bit further down the... There's a bit of cattle grazing. <laughs> yeah, and... cattle grazing, making pots, making some more wine, having babies, all yeah. the regular stuff. But of course, in this region, some stuff was happening a lot sooner than it was maybe in other countries. By 1300 BC, we actually had the first proto-Georgian kingdom of Colchis, which was founded on the coast of the Black Sea. I mean, it technically wasn't Georgia, but a lot of Georgians and a lot of people who've written about this region say, well, that's when Georgia was sort of first founded. That's when this ethnic race that could be considered Georgia today was, you know, that was there. It was put in place. It was an actual kingdom. It had a king. Stuff was going on. It was a country. They were trading with people, etc. Mm-hmm. By 1000 BC, just a little bit later, some Greek trading ports had actually set up on the Black Sea coast. So they were trading with this kingdom. And another kingdom called Iberia was uh, founded just next to Colchis. So it's like two kingdoms together, ruled separately, but considered to both be sort of pre-Georgian Georgian. So, yeah, there was stuff already going on. It's so crazy. It was so long ago. 1300 BC, they actually had a full culture going on here and everything. So then Alexander the Great turned up, of course, as he did. He did his massive attack across that entire region, across Turkey, etc. Not so great for everyone. No, great for him. Fourth century BC, he actually didn't specifically conquer Colchis and Iberia. He uh, sort of just traded with them and he conquered some of the lands around well, them. discovered they had this thing called wine. Yeah, and he's like, what is this? What is this? And they got him. Faced. No. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, by the 4th century BC, Greece definitely had one. Definitely, yes. So uh, that technology had already moved across. But yeah, so they were trading with Greece. They had a lot of influence from Greece. That could have affected the cuisine somewhat. Obviously, Balkan cuisine and uh, food from those regions would be here and will have affected the future of cuisine. Uh, next, it was the turn of the Roman Empire. Uh, I'm saying I'm only like halfway through the history here, guys. This, I'm going to try and smash through it as quickly as possible, but you know. But it is pretty crazy when you think about it. There's a lot of people that are hearing about Georgia for the very first time listening to this podcast. And then you hear that, what? Where they've got like just this crazy amount of history. It's it's insane for a place that you've probably never really heard of that has such amazing, vast, important history. Yeah, and I guess maybe in some countries, uh, like the US, perhaps when they opened the first Olive Garden, that was big news. But <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, it, Georgia's had a lot more years of history than um, than the USA, so it's quite a long story. But I'm going to try and smash through it as quickly as possible. Um, so yes, the Romans turned up, and they did actually conquer Georgia, as it were. They conquered all of those regions, um, but at that exact same time as they were like taking over Georgia, the Persians were coming from the other direction, from Iran, and they were both going like, "We'd like this land. It seems nice." They're, uh, they're doing good stuff. They're growing good things. It's a little bit less dusty than Iran. Yeah, yeah, I think we could have these nice valleys full of grass. So Georgia was stuck in the middle. So by 888 AD specifically, this is obviously some recorded information, uh, that Georgia was eventually heading towards its first true formation where it could be said to be Georgia and was occupying the lands that Georgia occupies today and having the same cultural history, etc. Uh, they were still struggling against Arab invasion and they had the now Byzantine Empire, which of course was the Roman Empire, turned into that after they lost Italy and moved to Istanbul. They were offering some protection, so they were still sort of involved with Georgia, but that struggle continued. But then by 1089, the 16-year-old King David began a campaign that would eventually lead to Georgia's golden age. Good old Davo. Yeah, 16 years old. And (laughs) apparently his father abdicated and left him the throne at 16. What? Dad's a dick. Who does that? Was it because he was wanting to bang an an American (laughs) chick called Mrs. Simpson? I think that's a different story from a different (laughs) age. You're about a thousand years out. (laughs) All right. (laughs) But uh, yeah, so King David at 16 went, well, I'm not happy with what's going on with this. Let's uh, assert ourselves and become the kingdom of Georgia proper. And by the 13th century, Queen Tamar is actually a queen. um, One of the few queens in that region at that time, she ruled over the full kingdom of Georgia at its greatest during its full golden age, where it was taking up all of Azerbaijan, a large part of northern Turkey, various parts of what is now Russia, north of Georgia. They took those lands as well. And almost half of the seaboard of the Black Sea, like around the coastline towards um, the other countries on the other side, Greece, etc. So she she really was doing the business. She was holding things together. Hashtag insert feminist quip right here. <laughs> Just saying. But of course... As of all things in the olden days, it was to be short-lived because the Mongols turned up. Oh, they were some nasty b****s. 
they were really a little pesky, weren't they? They were out to smash things and take stuff and Although eat Although actually, stuff. Mongolian history, I have to give it to them. If you do look into it, they would just sort of turn up and they would surround the village and they'd be like, hey, surrender to us, become part of us, you get pay. We're, we actually have a postal system set up and, you know, you just got to, you know, say that you'll fight with us and be part of us and we'll be cool. And if they said no, they'd be like, all right, going to kill all your, you know, women and children, whatever. I think they <laughs> killed the men first. I think they did kill the men first. They killed yeah. the men first. So if you surrender on the first day, then, or well, if you surrender straight away, we're not going to kill anybody. You'll just become part of the Mongolian kingdom and you're awesome. If you surrender on the next day, we're going to, you know, take over your city, kill all the men, but we'll spare the women and children. And if you don't surrender on the third day, we're literally going to kill all of you. Yeah. We will destroy every one of you, and then we'll take your city and own all your stuff. So, I got to kind of give it to them. They did give people a chance. Well, it's apparently... not a. It's one of those chances where you feel a little bit like it's biased towards you. <laughs> it's not a great chance. Like, would you like to all die, or would you like us to take all hmm, your stuff? Let me think. It's a, it's a difficult one. Yeah. Because up until that point, obviously, Georgia had been fighting lots of different people. They won battles. They'd lost battles. No one really expected the Mongolian horde to just kill everybody really efficiently. Yeah, they would have been like, you know what? We've, we've played this game before. Yeah, we'll, Let's we'll, we'll take up. you on. We'll yeah. see what happens. So, you know, war is war. History is history. This is what happens. I can't really say that the Mongolians were worse than any other culture Lots of people killed people and did stuff. But anyway, this is a food show, so let's let's not get too Dude, something deep. Something comes really good from the Mongolians. We're going some really good food. Mongolians. comes from the Mongolians. As let's I said, keep like, going quick. Yeah, keep with this history stuff, guys. Because seriously, even if you're not as interested in the history, the reason the food is so amazing is because of all of these steps. And yes, the Mongolians turning up did change Georgian food for the better. So over the next hundred years or so from when the Mongolians turned up and did their major campaign in 1236, then actually the Ottoman Empire was forming sort of at the end of that time as well. The Byzantine Empire was wrapping up what it had been doing and it was turning into sort of Ottoman Turkey. And they also started attacking Georgia. So all these lands that Queen Tamar had managed to rule over and was doing so well with were all getting taken back as well as most of Georgia pretty much getting taken over as well. And to cut a long story short, because it's already a long story, this stuff just kept going on for the next few hundred years. Ottomans were in, someone else was in, Iranians were attacking from the south again. Uh, then, of course, probably the most famous in recent history is the Russians took over all of Georgia, became part of the Soviet Empire. Before there was a Soviet Empire, it was the Russian Empire before um, it ended up being post-World War I, post-World War II stuff, where Lenin and um, Stalin and all those guys did their, thing. did their thing and actually turned it into a full-blown Soviet communist state. And of course, the, the craziest thing about this region compared to a lot of other places in Europe, they were still having trouble with Russia back in the 90s, the 1990s. When the Soviet Union broke up, unlike Germany, which got freed, and Poland and other countries, they were still having continuous problems. Wasn't it like 10 years ago or something like that? Like Russia, like, they just came over? Yeah, they reinvaded just over the border. And then, I don't know, like, old mate Putin or something was like, no, we didn't. And everyone's like, yeah, you did. And he's like, no, I don't know what you're talking about. There was another major incident in 2008. As we said, we're not going to go into the politics. The most important takeaway is that, of course, Russia was here for a very long time. So you will find Russian-influenced cuisine in Georgia. And from speaking to some Russian friends, apparently they are not surprised by Georgian cuisine at all because in Russia, Georgian cuisine is incredibly typical. They can get it everywhere. They're just like, yeah, that's like part of Russian cuisine. Yeah, I had no idea. Yeah. So we've been missing out because it's been uh, sort of held in well, this region. I don't region. know. I've been to Russia and all I had was like goulash and borscht. Maybe you didn't know what to look for. Yeah, maybe not. And now we do. And uh, you guys are going to know what to look for because we're going to tell you about some of the best food in Georgia. So yeah, in summary, all of these different cultures have affected how Georgian cuisine has developed. The Greek and Balkan influence, the ancient Roman influence, Middle Eastern, Turkish, Central Asian, and Mongolian coming through the Silk Road, and of course through conquests from Mongolians and Russian, and, and Indian influence. Indian influences came through Iran, and that then filtered its way up in this direction as well. So, it's not just a partial influence in this region, whereas say in England we were influenced by Chinese cuisine because people from Hong Kong came and lived in England, but here it was people who actually occupied the region. They brought their cuisine and their customs, and all of that stuff has sort of been developed and brought into Georgian cuisine and to Georgian culture. Hooey! 
agree. In the next half of this episode, the ingredients that make Georgian cuisine taste uniquely Georgian. Plus the story of one of their national dishes, kachapuri, the cheesiest bread on earth. Oh, yeah. That's crazy, hey? So that's a lot of history. Now let's talk about what you want to eat in Georgia. And most importantly, what are the sort of ingredients that make Georgian cuisine taste Georgian? Because mm. they definitely have some food here, which you might say is similar to other dishes, but there are lots of things that they put in their food that make you go, ooh, hang on, that's similar to something else, but it tastes like Don't Georgian Don't get food. those flavors anywhere but here. Yeah. So, I mean, they've got things that you expect them to have, like tomatoes that came from Latin America, chilies that also came from Latin America, all the different types of meats you'd expect to find around Europe, pork and beef and lamb and cheese, but they have some of their own special cheeses. So one of the most amazing things that we found from living here is unlike a lot of other countries where you're buying all your stuff from a supermarket, or even if you're buying from a green grocer, they're just selling produce that they bought from a, a mass manufacturer or a mass producer. Here, you can still just walk down the street and there'll be 10 different grocery stores all run independently by small families who get their the rest of their extended family are on the farm. They're growing the stuff. They're sending it into the city and they're selling it. They're making their own cheese on the farm. They're making their own wine on the farm. Oh, yeah. And you can buy this just in the local store, a tiny little corner store. It is not all mass-produced products. Yeah, we were just in there the other day and the chick was like, hey, this is what we've got in that's new today. It just came from our farm. And it's like eggs straight out of the chicken, <laughs> you know, it's like, which is the best way to get an egg straight out of the chook. Yeah. They had just made some more wine and we got, you know, a liter of their homemade wine and all the fruit and veg is so fresh and it doesn't go off as, as quickly as, as store-bought stuff from what we found in the past. Yeah. So this is it. You're bypassing the mass produced ingredients. You're bypassing as many uh, fertilizers. Uh, actually, one of the people we interviewed at one of the wineries said we don't really use a lot of commercial pesticides and never have because it's actually more complicated and more expensive and it damages the product that we're trying to put out. I found out. that really interesting. I think a lot of people will be interested in learning about um, how organic the wine is in the region. Not all of it has a organic certification, but many of them are actually trying to get that and they're getting and they are working to get it. It's just a little bit expensive for them. But also like, like the fruit and veg and stuff like that is all definitely very organic and very good. Yeah, they might have some sort of more natural pesticides, but it's not a big super pesticide area. No. So you're getting proper fresh produce and it's it's delicious. It makes the cuisine better. So let's talk through a few of the most important ingredients that are very, very Georgian and they help define the cuisine and give it the flavors that it has. First of all, let's talk about a couple of cheeses. Sulguni cheese. Mm, yeah. Yes, this is sort of like a cross between a firm mozzarella and a mild cheddar, but it has a slightly stronger piquant flavor to it. I mean, it's not spicy in any way, but you can you can taste it. It's got more of a flavor to it than either mozzarella or mild cheddar. Yeah, so it, but it's still kind of like a rubbery kind of cheese it in melts, texture. It melts very well. Oh, yes, it does. It's, it would be great for pizzas, but here they use it on their cheesy breads that we'll be talking about in a bit. And that specific type of cheese, the way it tastes and the way it melts and the way it crisps up on top and leaves little brown bubbles when it comes <laughs> out of the oven, uh, that affects a lot of dishes. And they don't just use it on breads, they use it in other meals as well. And we'll talk about some of those as we go through. Their other most important cheese, and they've got a few, but the one that's very widespread, you can find everywhere, is Emeretian cheese. Mm -hmm. which is much firmer, uh, not a hard cheese as such, but it's like a, a f just a firm white cheese. It's sort of like an extreme feta cheese. It, extreme is a word I would give it's it. It's salty like feta. It's real, like almost too salty. Yeah. I, I mean, don't get me wrong. I really love this cheese, but it's something you want to put in stuff. Like the other day, like we just cut off a slab and like just to chew on it for a snack and it was way too salty. But I love it in salads. I love it in stuff. I love it sprinkled on things. It's a little bit harder than a feta. It's a little bit saltier than a feta. And it doesn't crumble so much no, like a feta. It's not, it doesn't have that soft texture. It definitely has a firm texture. You have to chop it up with a knife. You're not going to sprinkle it on something with your fingers. And it's sort of got that bubbly, bubbly holes inside. It's like this mini honeycomb inside the, the cheese, in fact. And yeah, you can eat it on its own with a bit of wine, but it's really, really strong and really, really salty. But once you throw it inside a bread or you put it on a salad or in a salad, and then you lose that intensity, it mixes with everything, and then it makes the salads amazing. And then you don't have to be adding things like salt because it's already salty it's enough. It's already salty. I still put salt in. <laughs> <laughs> Another important ingredient that we don't really see in a lot of other places, purple basil. Oh, that stuff is so good. Basil. Basil. It's basil. It's basil, people. Listen, it's basil. <laughs> 
It's like a more pungent and much more intense version of regular green basil that you get from Italy. And it uh, legit is purple. Yeah, it's bright purple. Yeah. And they put it in salads, they put it on top of stews, and it just adds this sudden intense floral hit that's much stronger than basil. And you just go, oh, I'm eating Georgian food. Yeah. Now I know, yeah, this is, this is Georgian food. This is a Georgian salad. Fantastic. Another very unexpected ingredient. A little story about this one. We were trying to find out what this was for a long time. We went and did a cooking class. The chef told us she didn't really have a proper translation of this ingredient. She said it's called yellow flowers powder. And we're like, hmm, that's helpful. <laughs> <laughs> and we also thought, oh, we'll just ask someone later what that means. Yeah. And then every time we asked someone, they were like, what? What, what is that? What? <laughs> but now I thought the chef must be struggling. It must have a real name. But then we were in the supermarket when we got back to Georgia a few weeks ago and I went in there, I looked in the herbs and spices section, and there was a little pot called yellow flowers. And it was a little pot of powder called yellow flowers. It's like, she was telling the truth. <laughs> <laughs> Good God. It really is called yellow flowers. I've been asking everyone about that, actually. Yeah, I was like, what is this? They put it in the, in the walnut paste. What, what is this? It's in everything. And it makes everything taste Georgian. It's fantastic. I swear, you put that in, because in, Tom cooks a lot as well, and he puts that in, in the food, and I instantly go... I'm eating Georgian food. It's mm -hmm. this weird thing where you just automatically, yep, that's Georgia. That tastes like Georgia. I've never seen this ingredient anywhere else ever. We don't even know what the yellow flower is. Oh, I know. <gasps> you know? I have found out what it is. What is it? Now, the chef told us there was no substitute for this. You have to use the yellow flower powder. Is Otherwise, she a dirty liar? your food will not. No, she's not. There is no substitute for this. This oh. is why you have to come to Georgia <gasps> to actually taste this. But after a lot of searching online, I have discovered the yellow powder is powdered marigolds. No, really? Yeah. And marigolds grow all over the place, but no one uses them for cuisine. I would never... Well, you know what? I would think it would be something that the Chinese would like dehydrate and turn into a tea. That seems to make sense for me. But no, I never would have thought of turning it into a powder. Yeah, it's Marigolds. a powder and it makes the food delicious. Yeah. So it's fantastic. And it's also an ingredient in the next important spice. And this is one... Obviously, it's existed here for ages, but we only realized that it was really a thing on our second visit here. Uh, Sven... Etchen salt or Georgian salt. It's a special spiced salt blend that, yes, includes marigold as well as salt, obviously, uh, ground coriander seeds, blue fenugreek, which is another important spice that's used in a lot of food here in Georgia, and some other secret ingredients that the internet would not reveal to me. But <laughs> it's <laughs> did instant. the internet did it literally say no? I will not reveal this to you. <laughs> Google came up with an error. It said not for your eyes. Oh no! For Georgian eyes only. <gasps> Did you have to do like a, you had to like drop some blood onto, <laughs> onto a pad to prove your lineage? It wanted a lineage. full genealogy test yeah. <laughs> and I didn't have time to do it. All right. So I didn't do it. Next but yeah, time. you pretty much throw this salt on uh, meats, fishes, anything really, potatoes. You just add this salt and it's just a magic spice blend. It's like in Morocco, they have Raz Hal Hanout. Oh, which that stuff is amazing. It's just a blend of all the best spices and it just makes everything taste Moroccan. It's true. So you get that in Morocco and it's fantastic and you get this stuff in Georgia and it's fantastic. Yeah. And it's just, it very much is from those places and you just got to kind of deal with it. Yeah. I don't think you'll find it easily, but maybe one day this will start to be sold outside of Georgia. So another important spice, which is a little less Georgian, but Ajika. Made in Georgia, it's their version of chili garlic paste, and you can rub it on some veal ribs and grill them up in the oven, and it gives them just a tasty kick. So they do actually like a bit of chili here. Plenty of chilies growing around. Of course, chilies are from Latin America, but this is their version, mm -hmm. and uh, it also makes things taste a little bit Georgian. Um, final one I'm going to talk about, really important in Georgia, is walnuts and walnut paste. So important in this region, and I actually never have been in a destination that has used walnuts in the way that they use them here. And it's fantastic. I, I mean, you know, you have it in like a Waldorf salad and it's like, it's walnuts that were put into a salad or you have it in something else. And it's like, this is just walnuts in this. They actually really use it in interesting ways in Georgia. And it's so good. Yep. It's not just whole walnuts thrown on things. It is specifically the walnut paste 
And that is also mixed with spices like the marigold and uh, other important spices from around here to make this beautiful paste that they, they don't only use it to, as a salad dressing, they use it in other dishes. They stuff vegetables with it. They stuff fish with it. We'll talk about that a little bit more when we get onto the, the various dishes you need to try. But yeah, it's, it's awesome. It's delicious. I could eat it with a spoon, I reckon. It also works as a binding agent. So if they mix it into a sauce then it will make a nice thick sauce. Mm. Apparently, they even put walnuts in their beans. So you've got a pot of beans made with tomatoes, and they put ground walnuts in that as well to give the, the beans a flavor. In fact, I don't think we're going to be talking about Lobio in this episode because it's beans in a pot, and everyone does beans in a pot all around the world. So good, but Georgian beans in a pot, apparently they quite often do it with walnut paste as well. Interesting. So beans in a pot, Lobio, something you should definitely try when you're in Georgia as well. That's a little bonus one. All right, so that's all of the most important ingredients, in my opinion. I'm sure there are plenty of other ingredients, and hopefully we'll mention some of them as we go through the rest of the episode. Let's talk about... It's a Georgian national dish. Kachapuri. Yes. Kachapuri is Georgian cheese bread. And it's the most amazing thing that has ever touched my tongue and gone into my stomach. So the big debate is, is Georgian cheese bread better than pizza? And recently, Forbes released an article saying it has been voted better than pizza. Listen, I'm very torn by this because I love pizza and I love kachapuri. And I, and I don't really put them in the same category. Yes, it's bread. Yes, it's cheese. Yes, some of them are round. But the cheese is quite often in the kachapuri. It's not on top like a pizza. They put it on top as well. I don't know. I just find it different. And the bread consistency is different. Well, we're going to talk a little bit more about that as we move through this section. But, it's a tough um, one. It's a tough one. I, I'm, you know, I'm a little bit skeptical that Forbes managed to interview the right people and enough people to make this decision. How did they go along and go, well... They, they went to the place <laughs> in New York and tried it and went, yeah, that's good. One Georgian restaurant in New York yeah. and about 5,000 Georgian restaurants in Tbilisi. <laughs> so, you know, well, I'm sure the one in New York's great. Go try it out. Go search for it because you can get proper kachapuri there. I mean, you know, having kachapuri for the first time is a life-changing experience. Yes, one that you might put above pizza because you've had pizza your entire life. And then you have kachapuri and you're like, this is better than pizza. And it's like, no, it's not because did you go have pizza in Italy? Did you go have kachapuri in, Gre- in Greece? Where are we? Georgia? <laughs> Like, I, I'm not, I'm not going to let someone judge pizza against American pizza, although I know you're doing a good job, America, but you have to have Italian pizza if you're going to judge this. They have Italian pizza as well. But before we get into a massive rant on pizza versus kachapuri, <laughs> let's explain a little bit more about what kachapuri is and why it's different from pizza. So yes, it is a flour-based dough, but Unlike pizza, it's made with eggs and milk. I know some pizzas are occasionally made with milk. Some people use milk instead of water. But specifically, they almost always use eggs, milk, salt, and yeast to make the dough in kachapuri. Now, some cooks also add a little bit of sugar. I'm not very happy with that, with people who do that. But some do, and uh, it's not as good when they do, but some people like it that way. It makes it cakey. Yeah, it makes it too cakey. Also, if you add too much egg, it makes it more cakey. Yeah. So I like a low egg low sugar, no sugar situation so that it's not too much like a cake. When it's on the bready side rather than the cakey side, I think it's just one of the best foods in the world. Now, kachapuri, the word specifically means cottage cheese bread because kacha means cottage cheese. So it's your sort of uh, lumpy, I think everyone knows what cottage cheese is, right? I think so. It's your your lumpy fresh cheese and puri means bread. And the word puri is used, uh, derivative of that's used in other countries around this region as well, like Armenia, we've seen it used there. The ingredients that it's actually topped with, as well as the cottage cheese being either stuffed in the bread or on top of the bread, they actually vary. There's different sorts of cheese that are used. It's actually not always cottage cheese. And with some of them, it's not even that much cheese. It's a little bit of cheese mixed with potato and stuff. But something that can also feature is lots of butter, either the top. (laughs) That is an understatement. (laughs) That is an understatement of epic proportions, Mr. Williams. There's... (laughs) So with your basic kachapuri, you might have a bit of butter rubbed across the top so it's got a nice buttery crust. With some kachapuri, they've literally taken the end of the butter, chopped off about four ounces of butter, and then just let it sit on the top melting. A solid slab. 
It is quite fantastic. <laughs> it really is. It's one of the best things ever. So, yeah, lots of different styles. So, most of these Kachapuris are actually named after the region from whence they came. So, every single one sort of has a name that's based around the place that it's from, and everyone does them just a little bit differently. So, let's smash into the lightning round with number one. Ding, ding, ding. Imeretian Kachapuri, also known as Imeruli Kachapuri, which comes from the Imereti region. Very confusing, but it's the way it works. It is a circular bread which is stuffed with the local Imeretian cheese. Yep, that's the one we mentioned earlier. That is the super salty white cheese. Ajarian or Acharuli or Acharuli Kachapuri, which is from the state of Ajar on the southwest Black Sea coast of Georgia. This is actually a dough formed in the shape of an open boat. Yes, it is. It's fantastic. It's the best. It sort of looks like a Turkish pide. It's thick. It's maybe about over an inch in depth, and it is filled with cottage cheese and then topped with sulguni cheese and then topped at the end with a raw egg that you mix up into that hot cheese to cook and a massive slice of butter on top. Magruli Kachapuri, or Magrelian, which is similar to your Imeretian, but it has grated sulguni cheese added on top of the bread. And then you can also get your special or royal Magrulian, as well as the uh, grated cheese being baked on top. The bread is actually removed from the oven a few minutes before it finishes, and thin slices of sulguni are added, and then it's put back in to melt just enough, not to the point of browning, but just so it's like melty, gooey goodness. It's like a mix of crispy cheese, salty cheese stuffed inside, and gooey cheese on top. It's a triple cheese wonder. It's all of the best things in one kachapuri, in one bread thing. Oh my god. A charmer kachapuri, which is from the Abkhazia region, but also from the Ajar region, both on the Black Sea. Abkhazia is a disputed region of Georgia. Currently, it's sort of siding with Russia, and it's not exactly Georgia at the moment. But a charmer itself, as a food, is a multi layer flaky bread that actually looks a bit more like a cheese lasagna than a kachapuri. And it's buttery delicious. Oh my god, it was amazing. Ossetian or Osuri Kachapuri. This actually has potato as well as cheese in its filling. It's also quite similar to the Racha Kachapuri, which is a bread from the Racha area of Georgia, uh, which is just stuffed with potato. Yeah, and Ossetia is another state in Georgia that's contested and it currently is a bit more on the Russian side than the Georgian side. And it's actually very close to Racha and hence where those two breads are almost the same. The Penavani Kachapuri is sometimes labelled the puff Kachapuri uh, as it's made with a real puffier dough within the rest of them. This results in a flaky variety of the pie stuffed with cheese inside kind it's of thing. Sort of like, it's sort of like a more puffy version of the Emiratian Kachapuri that we mentioned at the start. And as well as those cheesy breads, of which there are probably a few more we haven't mentioned, there are other stuffed breads that are made without cheese, often those slathered with butter on top. Um, they, they have different names like Lobiani, which is stuffed with mashed beans, or Kubda one of our new favourites, which is stuffed with spiced beef. Oh my god, it's so good at three o'clock in the morning. It's so good at any time of day. <laughs> so as well as these stuffed breads, Georgia of course has its own standard plain bread which once again is hitting the mark as one of my favorite breads. It's drooling all over my like microphone. Like real French baguette in France and real Georgian shorty flatbread in Georgia are probably my two favorite plain breads that I've ever tasted anywhere in the world. I can dead set just sit down and we can walk to the store and buy a shoddy bread and barely make it home with any bread. <laughs> <laughs> Every time. We have to buy two. We do have to buy two. It is just munchable. You don't need anything on it. You'll just start eating the side and go, oh my God, it's amazing. They put a lot of salt in it. It is actually, very salty, actually, yeah, but I like that. I think that's the same with baguette. Baguette often has a bit more salt than other types of bread, and that's oh. one of the reasons I like it. Plus, it's crispy on the outside and soft on the inside. Oh, it's so good. And it also has this real crisp sort of ridge on it on one side. So one side's really fluffy, and the other side has this crispy rim that you can just kind of break off, and it's nice little crunch, crunch bits. So the main reason for this is because it is cooked on the interior side of a sunken round stone oven. Like a tandoori so, oven. Like, similar from a tandoori oven. So it's a lot bigger than a tandoori oven uh, in width, and it's not as deep as a tandoori oven. So it's like a shallow, wide tandoori oven made from stone. 
the shorty bread is shaped into a sort of diamond shape, so it gets fat in the middle and it goes long and thin at each end. And that's the reason why one side of it is crispy and the other side is fluffy is because one side is closer to the bottom of the oven where the heat is, so that cooks quicker. And of course, all the bubbles that are coming because of the yeast bubble upwards due to the old gravity beast, and that causes all the fluffy bits to I mean, go to the we top. we should literally explain, if you don't know what a tandoori oven is or how it works or even a Georgian oven, they actually take the dough and slap it to the side of this oven. The heat of the wall causes the dough that's sticky and cold to instantly stick and start yeah, cooking so to the wall. Yeah, so it's not like trays like a regular no. oven. It's, it's, it's on the side of this round oven that's in the ground. Yeah, and it just hangs there because it's sort of stuck to the wall because of the heat instantly cooking the bottom. But it means that just like a pizza, even though this is cooked vertically rather than horizontally, the bottom of it goes really nice and crispy as oh, well and browns up. And the top of it goes sort of nice and fluffy. And Do you want to go get some shots right I, now? I, yeah, let's... Right, we're going right, to come bye. back in about 20 minutes. <laughs> just going to go down the hill and get some shoddy bread. Now, this dough, unlike Kachapuri, is made without eggs. So this is more of your classic just flour, water, bread, bread. and salt. And yeast, of course. And that's why it puffs up all nicely. So... Pretty much every bread that we've just mentioned is something that you should definitely try in Georgia and Tbilisi when you're here. You can get all of this here. You can find it on menus. The bread's just amazing. Yeah. It's just and, so And none amazing. of those things... Well, okay. So, so some of the ones from the disputed areas, of course, we haven't even tried and you can't really get those. But every, every other one, you can absolutely get there on the menus and go through, just work your way through the menu and try them all. Well, the one that's like a lasagna, you can find. It's on some menus. And the one that's stuffed with potato, you can get the one that's similar to the one from the Ratcha region. But we don't really love potato carbs and carbs you do have issues with carbs and carbs, carbs he, and hates, carbs. he hates carbs and carbs he won't even eat a burrito he hates carbs and i will carbs. eat a mexican burrito because it's made without tons of rice and it's made with lots of vegetables and meat but an american burrito that's full of rice <laughs> carbs and carbs but you love chips in a gyros i like a couple of chips in a gyros and if they left them out i wouldn't complain <laughs> right. if they put more meat in and replace the fries Fair with news. meat that would be better Fair than a standard euros, but it's fine. So, yeah, the full list of these breads can be found on our article, foodfuntravel.com slash Georgia podcast. There's loads of other foods on there as well. I mean, we're going to talk about a lot more coming up because, of course, there's so many. There's so many, and we've only really talked about bread yeah, so Yeah, you think far. we're wrapping it up? We ain't wrapping nothing up. So, a little bit on the history of Georgian bread. How did this all come about? Now, for the modern times, we mentioned that Forbes is saying Kachapuri is better than pizza. Now, apparently a poll in Georgia suggested that 88% of Georgians do still prefer Kachapuri to pizza. I, I think that's sort of a, that's an unfair test. If that's what Forbes were using, I don't know. I have to figure that out. But, you know, you ask Italians, what are they going to say? They're probably going to flip the other <laughs> yeah. way, aren't they? And there's probably going to be a few more Italians than there are Georgians. <laughs> now, if you had a whole room full of Italians... 100 Italians in a massive room and they all agreed that Kachapuri was better than pizza, well, then maybe that's something to think to about. You would have to get a bunch of people in a room and blind taste test mm -hmm. them. That's the only possible way to come to any conclusion with this situation. I don't know how you could get away with it because I would say it would be really obvious what's pizza and what's not pizza. Unless you said it was like a margarita. Yeah, it'd have to be a straight up margarita pizza. But that's got versus... tomato on, so it can't even be that. It's going to have to be a white-based cheese pizza. Which is like the... The worst of the pizzas. It's well, not even fair. I don't know. It's still got cheese and it's still got pizza bread. I, I know. It's still good. But I don't. I think quite often, how many times have we been in Italy and it's been the tomato sauce that's made our, our knees go weak? Many they times. They make amazing tomato sauce. And that's what I think what makes pizza so incredible. I, they do have some good white base ones. I will give you that. But I personally feel that the texture between the two is very different. I would know the difference between a pizza and a cacciapuri, I think, if you put it in my mouth. Because the texture is very different and it's made very differently. Yeah, I think you would. So maybe if you didn't know anything about Kachapuri and they did it blind test, yeah. maybe. But it's, I don't think it's a really it's a fair test. I think it's silly. I read another article by another very big publication. You might have heard of this, the BBC. Um, th you don't know that one? No. Uh, yeah. um, they suggested that Kachapuri was like a distant cousin to pizza due to the long period of time when the Romans were here. Now, we mentioned mm. that the Romans were here, and yes, they were here for about 700 years, and the Byzantine Empire after that still had some influence on the region. But I'm not buying this story at all. I'm surprised that the BBC even published this. I mean, it wasn't their testimony. They interviewed someone who lived in Georgia, and that person said, yeah, you know, you can see the similarity. It's a cheese bread. It's flat. It's round. It's just like pizza. Obviously not someone who is a food historian, because if they were, they should realize that the modern pizza... At the very earliest, 
is recorded as being invented in the 16th or 17th century. Probably the 18th century. So, so far after the Roman Empire collapsed, it's not funny. Yeah. The Romans did not take this bread to Georgia 2,000 years ago. Because if they did, why have they not had pizza in Europe until more recently? Yeah. A lot of the places I've read about this, uh, 1760 is probably the original pizza in yeah. Naples. So that's actually 18th century. Yeah. And then famous, famous pizza wasn't until the late 19th century. All right. So the Romans bringing it into Georgia is BS. So what is your theory on this? Okay. So I've looked at lots of different options. And after eating so many different breads here and looking at the types of ingredients they used to make it because the dough is made with egg and looking at the way that food has moved around the region, I'm going to say it's more likely to have existed because of naan bread. We were talking about the tandoori mm-hmm. oven before. So Georgians make shoddy bread in something that's very similar to a tandoori oven. Absolutely. And the bread dough is made with eggs and milk, which although not every naan bread is made with eggs and milk, it's pretty typical to use eggs and milk, especially in the thicker stuffed naan breads. I would also say texture wise, like that, the fluffiness that you get from a naan. Because it's more cakey. Yeah. Just a little bit more cakey. It's slightly cakey bread Mm. because of the egg. And... I think that's where we're going. I mean, it's a stuffed bread, so it has a layer of bread on top with the stuff inside. And yeah, sure, they throw stuff on top, but they do that with naan breads as well. They put butter G on top, they put herbs on top, they put garlic on top, and they stuff inside, they stuff meat, kima naan. I would say kima naan is so similar to the kubdari meat stuffed bread here. Uh, Yeah, I mean, they normally use lamb, but it's... It's very, very similar. So I had a little bit of digging into the history of naan bread just to see if any of this would add up. And it turns out that sometime around the 17th century or a little bit before, naan bread was already moving out of India and into Iran. And we also know from reading the history that uh, Iran was sort of in and out of Georgia for a while as well, as was the Ottoman Empire. And this was pre-Russian invasion. So this was the time where influences from the South could definitely have been bringing cuisine in. So the question is, were people eating lots of kachapuri before then? Hmm. Because if they were... Then then they just... Like, because there are instances of things being created separately on opposite sides of the planet and no one actually knew... You know, there was there was no connection between them. It's just two people just happened to go, what if I put this together and give this a try? It has happened and it is possible. It's common ingredients. Yeah. They've got they've got bread making facilities and they've got egg. I mean, kachapuri isn't made in a tandoori oven. It's made in a flat oven. Yeah. Because otherwise all the cheese would leak off the side. So <laughs> yeah. So yeah, they don't they're not baking them in the tandoori oven or in the Georgian oven, but the taste and the style is so unbelievably similar. I'm like, was kachapuri really a big thing here until more recently? And then you look at the Achiruli kachapuri we were talking about, which is the boat, diamond-shaped boat that looks a bit more like a Turkish pide. It's like thicker, but it's also then got fillings in the middle. I mean, that seems like that's just been influenced from Turkey. Is it possible that Turkey was influenced by uh, kachapuri Achiruli before? Did they invent it? And then Turkey went, here's a lighter, thinner version. I don't know, because people don't seem to have specific definite... So you're uh, saying dates. Turkey's done the Pizza Hut thin crust pizza <laughs> version to your classic, <laughs> to your classic crust? Is that what's happened here? What I'm saying is that they almost certainly would have been breaking bread for thousands of years because, mm-hmm. of course, bread making was around, and they would have had cheese for a very long time because that's also been around for a long time. And the likelihood that they combine cheese with bread is quite high. But, Absolutely, yeah. Um, you know, did this evolve independently? Was it something that someone came up with, and then everyone around this region went, "That's great." And that influenced people around here. And naan bread just met in the middle, maybe. And maybe. They, it had been invented uh, independently. We would be really interested to know if there are actually any food historians from this region that have an idea of exactly how the bread came about and, and the history of it, please do let us know. Uh, email us at megzi at foodfundtravel.com. And uh, if, if we've got this completely wrong, let us know. But if we're on the right track, also let us know because we actually don't really know. I can't find any sources that prove either way how Kachapuri came to be. As I said, the closest thing I got was someone saying it was the Roman influence, and that's ridiculous. Now, the Romans invented pies, which, of course, is a filling stuffed in pastry, mm-hmm. and they spread that around all of Europe. And Thank good you. on them. Thanks, good Romans. On Thank you. But of course, that's not really egg based. It's normally a fat mixed with flour to make pastry. That's very different. So, stuffing something inside of something is quite common since the Roman era for shizzle. Stuffing something inside of something is, is, is not 
you know, inventing the wheel. I mean, it's not a Tadurkin. It's not quite as original <laughs> as that. I still haven't tried that. Yeah, the stuffing stuff inside of stuff. It could have easily been invented simultaneously or just some dude came from India and went, we have this oven, it's, it's really good and it's round. And then Georgians went, cool, we'll do that. Yep. It could have just been one dude who just turned up and everyone went, ooh, it's like a magic show. How's he getting the bread to stick to the outside? I just don't know. And no one else seems to know. No one's written about it. I can't find any information about it. So please, yes, tweet us at Food Fun Travel or email us at Megzi at Food Fun Travel if you have any idea on whether there's any definitive evidence either way, because we cannot find any. And we would like to know. But what we have discovered, of course, is that Kachapuri is delicious. So yep. wherever it came from. It also makes me fat. Yeah, and I love makes it. everyone fat. I love it. I don't care. Whatever happens and why it's here, we don't mind. Uh, we're just really happy that Hashtag it's here. Hashtag no regrets. Okay, that's it for this episode. We have covered one of Georgia's most famous national dishes, kachapuri, talked about history and some of the fantastic ingredients that make Georgian cuisine taste uniquely Georgian. But the amazing thing about Georgia is that there is so much more to cover. Oh, yes. We've barely got started, which is why we have another episode on Georgian cuisine coming up next. Look for that now. It's been simultaneously released at the same time as this one, so it is available. And we're going to be talking about their other national dish, kinkali. Oh, I love kinkali so much. Find out about the different types of kinkali that we have here and that you can come and try. There's lots and lots that we love. Yeah, like all of them. No, I don't like the potato. But anyway, we'll talk about that next episode. Plus a selection of some of our other favorite dishes, including one that's made with epiploon. Any idea what that is? I know what it is. I'm going to leave everybody in the dark. It's uh, it's in in bits. It's an interesting food. Anyway... So we've covered all the history. In the next episode, we're going to be talking pretty much just about food and about some of the crazy stories that have happened to us when we've been going around the country eating these different foods. So do follow us for that. And of course, follow the podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen. Do go and subscribe. If you subscribe, it gives us some brownie points and iTunes goes well. These guys must be doing well. And leave us a five-star review as well while you're there because that gives us extra, extra loving. And we love hearing what you guys think of the show. The more reviews we get that are five star, the higher our show goes in the ratings and the more likely as we get new listeners and new listeners means more podcasts because we can keep making them if we've got listeners. Because if no one's listening to us, why would we make podcasts? That'd be crazy. <laughs> Not even my mom's listening to it. So, geez, I need someone. You should get her to listen to it. I like, should. seriously, I'm that's gonna... the first person to ask. I'll email her right now. Uh, also, if you love the show and you do want to support us financially so we can commit more time to making episodes rather than doing our other regular work, then please support us on our Patreon account, which is from Podbean. You can go to foodfundtravel.com slash extras. That will redirect you straight to our Podbean patron account. And from as little as $1.50 a month, you can, you know, have a warm, fuzzy feeling inside and get access to bonus episodes. Woot woot! Who doesn't want that? Exactly. All right. See you next time on our second part of the Georgian Food Podcast. Thanks for listening to The Dish. Don't forget to subscribe and keep this podcast on the air by giving us a five-star review on iTunes or wherever you listen. Also, come join our foodie community on Facebook in the Food Worth Travelling For Facebook group. Catch you next time.